Um, at uh, Champion Life Church in Altoona, uh, downtown Altoona, uh, they are having a, a week of meetings here uh, beginning tonight called Revive Altoona. Um, every night at 7 p.m., they're having a variety of speakers, and um, they are crying out to God for revival, and they want to see uh, many who are lost be found and be saved. And so uh, I encourage you to pray for what they're doing here this week, uh, that God would do great things um, in their church and through their ministry. Uh, and also, you may want to stop by yourself and, and see what God is doing there and, um, and to, to hear the word of God there and be part of that. So I wanted to let you know that that's a Champion Life Church uh, in Altoona, uh, beginning tonight and going uh, all week long, Sunday through Saturday uh, at 7 p.m. The scripture reading for today is from two passages of the Bible. The first one is Romans chapter 1, and I encourage you to take your Bibles that you brought or that you have in the seats in front of you and turn there with me. Romans is the, the sixth book in the New Testament, so this is about seven-eighths of the way through the Bible. It is after the book of Acts, before the book of 1 Corinthians. You can look in the table of contents if you need to uh, find that, if you need to track that down. Romans is a letter written to the church at Rome by Paul the Apostle, one of these early Christian leaders. And uh, this is actually the uh, only um, systematic or quasi-systematic, somewhat systematic uh, letter that we have from Paul where he sort of treats um, his whole subject of his message uh, that he proclaimed wherever he proclaimed it from beginning to end. This is from close to the beginning. We're in Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. I'm going to read verses 18 through 32, through the end of the, of the chapter. <clears throat> Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts, even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. The second scripture reading is also from Paul. This is from the book of Colossians. So just page a while to the right in your Bible. It's uh, after First and Second Corinthians, then Galatians, then Ephesians, then Philippians. And then you get to Colossians, which was a letter written to the church at Colossae, which Colossae was in what is present-day western Turkey, it's in ruins now. It's not still there. But we're going to read uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 14. Paul writes, Do not lie to each other, 
since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. If you wish, you may uh, turn back to that Romans passage because we are going to look at that somewhat here. We'll, we'll swing back to Colossians at the end, but I'll throw that up there on the slides if you need that when we get to that point. For these last several weeks, as you know, if you've uh, been with us for that period of time, I've been talking on the related topics of sex and marriage and what God says about it in the Bible and what Christians believe about these things. I've been talking about these not because they are necessarily the most important things, but they are extremely important. They're the source of the life of every one of us. And for all of those humans who ever live or will live, and they're so critical to human flourishing, and even when they go bad, as things so often do in a sinful world, to our destruction. And I've been talking over time, as I've been talking about these things, I've not only been speaking about the what of what Christians believe about sex and marriage, but also the why, why we believe what we believe. And I've thrown out over the course of these weeks five whys that we derive from the Bible, five reasons that undergird what we say is right and wrong, true and false about sex and marriage. And that first one, that God loves you enough to speak through the Bible and we can understand it, is what I spent the first two weeks of this series talking about. After that, I moved on to talk about marriage, what it is, uh, that marriage is a whole person covenant that unites one man and one woman. And we talked about sex and how God created it to be good and, uh, and the nature of that and how it functions and is supposed to function within marriage. And we also talked about singleness, how to live single on purpose and how singleness itself is a good and godly thing for those who are called to it for a portion or for their entire lives. Since then, I've also talked about specific sexual issues from the point of view of what sex is supposed to be, specifically premarital sex and pornography. And you can catch all of these messages at firstbaptisthpa.com slash sermons. That's the church's website. You can find that in your bulletin. You can go to the church's website and pick up on those. And as I've said at every point so far, everything that I'm saying is built on what I've already said. So if I say certain things, you think that doesn't make sense or I'm not buying that or I don't believe it. There's a strong chance that I may have handled that in a previous message. And I'll make reference to some of those later today. Today is the last message that is focused directly on a sexual issue. Next week, we're going to turn back to look at marriage and focus on marriage for a while. But today, I'm talking about homosexuality and transgender. Now, you had to know that this was coming, if you've been in this series, that at some point I was going to talk about this. There are many in our world that think this is the only thing that Christians care about, and they talk about, and they obsess about it, and they just focus on this one minor issue. And I hope that you know that if you've been here through this time, that that could hardly be the case. In fact, it's not for nothing that this is number eight in the series, that I had to talk about stuff for seven weeks that you've had to suffer through in order to get to this point, because otherwise, what I'm going to say today doesn't even make any sense. But it is something that we have to talk about. And these two topics of homosexuality and transgender, I've learned in my research of these, which I've spent more time and effort researching these things over the last few months than ever before in my life. And I've learned in the course of that research that in a big way, these really don't belong together in one message because they're two different motivations and they're two different experiences. Homosexuality is about which sex you are attracted to And transgender is about which sex you are. And in general, homosexuals are not transgender, and vice versa. Although defining it gets sticky when a man who thinks he's a woman is attracted to a man. 
Is that homosexuality or not? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But I'm also talking about these things together for three reasons. One is time. Uh, already, this is a long sermon series, and uh, time is at a premium. Secondly, though, they're grouped together in modern identity politics. What I mean by identity politics is the idea that I and the members of my group have a certain identity, there's a certain feature of our humanity that this is the, the description, the, the overall title of who we are and what we are, and our political agenda is defined by who we are and what we are, and our role in the democratic process is focused on achieving a greater benefit or greater room or uh, lifting up within society of who we are and what we are. And within that, within modern identity politics, homosexuals and transgender and bisexuals also have made common cause. And so we, we find them together in our political public realm. But third, and most importantly, of why I'm talking about them together is that from a biblical perspective, both of these, both homosexuality and transgender, have to do with a violation of the boundary between male and female that God created when he created humanity. But I want to stress that just because I just used the word violation, which I did so very much intentionally on purpose, that does not mean that a person with same-sex attraction or a person with gender confusion is personally guilty of violating that boundary. And I'll explain why that is in a bit. And I also want to be very clear that I'm not giving this sermon today to people who are outside the church. Though if people who are outside the church happen to hear it, if they happen to you know, find that message online and listen to it, that's great, that's fine. And if, and if you're outside the church, if you're not uh, a, a member of of this church or a church, uh, then it's fine that you're hearing it too. I am giving this message, however, to people who are inside the church. A friend of mine from, from some time ago, uh, his name was Ryan, and when he graduated from uh, college, he wanted to reach out to and present the gospel to the homosexual community. So what he did is he went to Indianapolis and he applied for a job and got hired to work in a gay coffee shop. And when he was there working in that gay coffee shop, everybody who was there knew that he was straight. And everybody who was there knew that the reason that he was working there is because he wanted them to believe in Jesus. And so people had different reactions to that, customers at this coffee shop. Some people really gave him a hard time. And they would really bust his chops on stuff and say, you know, they'd come up to him and they'd get their coffee and say, so what are you doing here? You think I'm going to hell? You think I'm going to hell because I'm gay? And what, what Ryan would say to them is, you're not going to hell because you're gay. You're going to hell because of what you do with Jesus Christ. And that is a powerful and true statement. You're not going to hell because you're gay or lesbian or transgender. You're going to hell because of what you do with Jesus Christ. Because God has given an opportunity for mercy and an opportunity for grace to all sinners, to all people of all kinds, gay and straight, transgender and cisgender. And all of us have the opportunity to get right with God through Jesus Christ. And that, and that alone, is the determining factor of whether a person is going to hell. And so because of that, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, and, it's not, and he wasn't talking about homosexuality, but he was talking about sexual practice. He said, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. See, Paul is saying that God has set a standard for human conduct. And it applies to all people, all human beings. But those who are outside the church, those who, are, who have not said by faith and baptism, I am following Jesus Christ and I am a part of the church, those, God is going to deal with those people directly. But within the church, God deals with those people indirectly through the church. Sometimes he deals with them directly too, but he's expecting those who are part of the church to deal with each other. We're going to talk more about this in a future message. And so that's what I'm doing today. This is a sermon for Christians. This is a sermon for Christians who are attracted to people of the same sex. This is a sermon for Christians who, whose sense of their own gender does not line up with the sex of their physical body. This could be any of you, and I would never know it. And so it could be for any of you here today. And that's who I'm giving it to. 
Now, you might be expecting that I'm going to say a fair amount of no in this sermon. You know, you can't do this and you can't do that, and you're probably right. But I want to stress again that the heart of what we believe is a big yes. A big yes. I want us to look again at why number two. God invented sex and marriage for our good and for his. So our foundation is a big yes to what God has done. A big yes to what God has made. A big yes to his purposes for our lives that are for our good and also for his good in what he is doing in the whole universe. And so our focus is the big yes. And our big yes in this case is found in Genesis 1.27. God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This is the big yes. The big yes is that God specially, lovingly made human beings as the most glorious feature of his indescribably glorious creation to shine forth his glory in this world. And the sexual distinction between male and female is critical to it. We saw this in Genesis 2 also in a previous message, the very next chapter of the book of Genesis, where we see God creating humanity. He creates a man, a male, Adam. And he says it's not good for the male to be alone. It's not good for him to be alone. And so he created female from Adam, from this human being. So male and female, bone of bone, flesh of flesh. They are of the same substance and yet they're truly different. And it's in coming together and being one in sex and marriage and procreation that comes out of that sex and marriage. That that the image of God is reflected and created in this world. The image of the Trinity who is one and yet three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Son coming from the Father, the Spirit coming from the Father and the Son. We talked more about this in a previous message. If you go to the message on marriage, uh, the third message in this series, you can see more about this where I talked at length. However, despite that good, beautiful, wonderful creation of, of humans by God in his image to reflect his image in the world, we, the human race, did not stay at our job. We didn't keep doing our job of reflecting God's image and his glory and being glorious in his glory. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, were deceived by the devil into thinking that they could generate their own glory instead of reflecting God's. And everything in this world has been a wreck ever since. That's how death entered the world. That's how disease entered the world. That's how crime and injustice entered the world. That's how want entered the world. That's how fruitless labor entered into the world. This, has re- this is how broken relationships has entered in the world, and this has wrecked all people. As I do every week, there are scripture references in a bulletin insert that I've given you so that you can look up any of these at home, and I've added some extra ones there that I'm not going to mention, including a whole series of scriptural backing for this idea that all humans, every single human, is infected by sin and guilt and its results. And a result of this wreck I'm sorry, I may have knocked something out. I want to make sure that this is all fit together down here. Okay. I kicked something down there by accident. So I'm going to ma- oh, and it looks like it's still a problem. So I don't know what I did wrong that may have, uh, that may have caused a problem here. There is a- So, hopefully we're okay now. So a result of this wreck is that every human being is disordered. None of us work the way we're supposed to work. We're defective. For one thing, apart from God's intervention, our perception of what is right and true is fundamentally askew. If you look in Romans 1, you can see this. You can see how this... Whoa, I just got hooked there too how this works in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, we see that these people, and if you look at verses 18 through, through uh, 25, that he's describing all people on the planet, that, that the nature of God being God was obvious to them just by looking at the creation. It was evident just by looking at the world. And yet, their, their own minds and hearts became darkened It says that they neither glorified God as God or gave thanks to him. And so their foolish hearts were darkened and they exchanged the glory of God for images made to look like mortal man and reptiles and animals. 
And so they started to worship idols made of created things. They worshiped the creation rather than worshiping the creator. And so they continued on this way. And not only did that happen, not only did human beings become fundamentally messed up in our perception of things so we couldn't recognize God anymore, but also our desires are fundamentally askew apart from God's intervention. And we see examples of that at the end of the chapter in verses 28 through 32. We have all these things where they have a depraved mind that they want to do what ought not be done, evil, greed, and depravity, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slander, hating God, insolence, arrogance, boasting, hating their parents, being senseless, heartless, faithless, ruthless, all of these different things. And Paul isn't saying that all people exhibit all of these things equally. But he is saying that among all people, these sorts of characteristics exist because we are fundamentally messed up. All people have sinned. All people want to sin. All people have a basic innate desire to do bad stuff, and we don't even know we're doing it most of the time. Well, same-sex attraction and gender misalignment are part of this disorder of sin. Not everybody has it, but some people do. And not everyone who has it wants it. In fact, probably most people don't want to be that way. But they have it all the same. And whether they want it or not, whether they agree with it or not, there is in themselves a powerful yearning to say no to the big yes of the image of God as male and female in what they are and in what they do. So as I said before, my message today is to Christians with same-sex attraction or gender misalignment. I'm talking to people who want God to be glorified in their bodies, who want to reflect his image, who agree that the Bible is his message, who agree that God can be trusted, and they want guidance about how to handle those desires that they have inside and those sense of themselves. And so first what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk to Christians with same-sex attraction, and then I'm going to talk to Christians with gender misalignment, and then I'm going to talk to our whole church. So first of all, same-sex attraction. So I can't cover remotely all of the arguments and all the objections and everything having to do with homosexuality in 10 minutes. I'd love to, but I don't have the time. If If you want that, your best bet, I think, is probably stuff written by this guy, Robert Gagnon. Now, a word about Robert Gagnon. First of all, a lot of what he writes is highly technical. He's a biblical scholar, and a lot of stuff he writes about the Bible is highly technical. You need to know a lot of stuff about, you know, the ancient languages and so forth to follow it, at least in what I read by him. Um, Another thing about Robert Gagnon that I want to tell you, this is very interesting. Gagnon does not agree with sound teaching and sound doctrine on Scripture. In other words, in in what Scripture is. He does not believe that all of it is, is completely from God. He does not believe that all of it is accurate. He does not believe that all of it is written by the people that it says that it's written by. He doesn't believe that we can take all of it as God's word. Um, And in a lot of ways, I strongly disagree with him. But this is the amazing thing. Even he, despite all of that, believes that if you're going to take the Bible as any sort of basis for moral authority at all, you must come to the conclusion that homosexual practice is a violation of male and female in the image of God. This is a guy who actually doesn't even believe the whole Bible is true, but actually believes that homosexuality is not God, that homosexual activity, practice, is not God's will for people. The basic statement about homosexuality in the Bible is that men must not be sexually intimate with men, and women must not be sexually intimate with women. That is a stern, inflexible rule that is uncontested in the Bible. We see it described here in Romans 1. We also find basis for it in the book of Leviticus, where it's referred to as one of a number of things called an abomination. Most of the other things that are called abominations throughout the Old Testament are terrible, terrible things that we would not agree with. Things like incest, things like adultery, things like robbing the poor, things like idolatry, all manner of other things that that could be talked about with that. And the chief problem with homosexual activity, as Paul describes it here in Romans 1, is that it requires a person to simulate being the opposite sex in order to satisfy their partner. In other words, it requires a man to simulate what a woman does in order to deliver to a man sexually. And it requires a woman to simulate what a man does in order to deliver to a woman sexually. So the issue with with same-sex intimacy uh, is that 
it is requiring us to temporarily, momentarily alter the nature that we have as gendered beings. Another problem is that it's a flagrant disregard of the creator's intent for sex, even for someone who does not know him. In other words, even for someone who's not received the revelation from God in the Bible, it ought to be evident, Paul says, just by looking at the human body and how it's created and how it works, what God's intentions are for the human body. This comes to the fifth of these five whys. Human nature is created good but fallen, so nature gives us a clue to what's right but not the whole story. And it cuts two ways in this. Number one, it means that because of nature, human nature is created good, that we can look at the body and see, even if you don't know anything else about God, you can see what God's intention was for how the body was supposed to work in reproduction, in procreation. But, and also in sexual pleasure. But also, because we're fallen, nature doesn't give us the whole story. Because if I, as an individual, have desires that don't conform to God's will, I can't just go with my desires and say, well, that's my nature, that's who I am, therefore it's right. Yet another problem with, with same-sex intimacy, same-sex sexual intimacy, is that it further divorces sex from marriage and from procreation. Those three things are linked. Sex, marriage, procreation. Now this seems less convincing to people nowadays because we have such a thing called birth control. And because of attempts to control the population and the limit overpopulation at times and places, and because of the legitimacy of sexual intimacy after childbearing years are over. But these three things that the world has split apart, sex, marriage, and procreation, should remain linked in our thinking and behavior because God linked them. As we've already seen in previous weeks, sex and marriage are supposed to go together. There shouldn't be sex without marriage, and there shouldn't be marriage without sex. Marriage itself is a whole person union of complementary beings for the purpose of procreation and the creating of the ideal environment in which raising young should happen. It's the, it's the unit of man and woman that uh, one man and one woman that's the only thing that human beings do biologically that an individual can't do all by themselves, like breathe, like eat like regulate body temperature. The only thing that a human being cannot do by themselves that's part of a bi our biological nature is reproduction, which only happens between one man and one woman. Procre and, and marriage itself is supposed to be friendly to procreation. There shouldn't be marriage without the option, the, the possibility, as God makes it possible, for procreation to occur. So sex, procreation, and marriage are supposed to go together. We live in a world in which they're totally split apart almost where what I do with my sex is over here and my marriage is over there and whether we have kids or not is over there and they're completely independent from one another. So to keep the big yes of the image of God as male and female, we have to say no to certain things, including homosexual activity. Now, of course, there are objections to this. For example, when people say, but I was born this way, I can't help it, I was born this way. Well, yes and no. There's no convincing scientific evidence that homosexuals are indeed born that way in the sense that there are genes that absolutely positively require that activity. There may be genetic predisposition, probably is, but environment seems to have a lot to do with it. In fact, people shift over time. There's, there's, a, there's a spectrum and a gradation between I only am interested in, my, in the opposite sex and I'm only interested in the same sex. And many people, homosexuals and heterosexuals alike, but especially homosexuals, are at different points along the gray area in between at different times in their lives. But that's not really the point, is it? We're not really, the, the point is not really whether we're born with it. What people are really saying is, I have a deep-seated, profound yearning for romantic and sexual intimacy with someone of the same sex, and I can't turn it off. That's what people are really saying. And that deserves our profound sympathy. But a desire is not good just because it's deep. I mean, imagine someone saying that same thing about something we can easily agree with, with is wrong. Like, for example, imagine somebody said, I have this deep-seated desire to steal, and I can't turn it off. Therefore, stealing is good. No, stealing is not good. No matter how deep that desire is, stealing is still not good. Or imagine about something else sexual that we can all agree is wrong. Pedophilia. I mean, people who, who are pedophiliacs, pedophiles, they have an extremely deep-seated desire that they can't turn off 
for sexual intimacy with a child. That doesn't mean it's good. None of us would agree that that means it's good. So why would we use that same reasoning with homosexuality? Another objection is I should be free to be who I am. And in our place and moment in history, people consider freedom to be the ability to express yourself completely and yourself is applauded by everyone around you. So I'm free if I can just express myself and, and, not just I can express myself, but I can express myself and everyone around me says that that's good. If I express myself and one person around me says that's bad, then I'm not free. That's the mindset of our culture. That makes no sense. That makes no sense even for mature people in our culture. But beyond that, according to the Bible, freedom is the ability to become your best self, not the self you are now. Freedom isn't the ability to act on your natural desires. Freedom is the ability to overcome your natural desires until God replaces them with perfect ones. Now, as for homosexuality being who I am, I'll come back to that later, though, because there is something deep and important that we need to sympathize and recognize and speak to as Christians on that. But I want to give right now a godly alternative. A godly alternative to acting out one's homosexual desires. In the interest of time, I'm just going to give this from a male perspective. Some of this applies to women, some does not. Try to translate as well as you can. I have a friend that I'm going to call Bob. Bob was raised in a Christian home. When Bob entered puberty, he had very strong attractions he, well, he had attractions to both genders. And then as he got older, it became focused on attractions to men. When he left home to go to college, he lived those out. And when he lived those out, he also gave up on God, gave up on the church. He lived um, that way for seven years. And he ended up having a, a good job as a professional and a, a man that he loved very much, that he lived with. And the two of them were living their life together, but Bob began to have doubts. He began to wonder, am I really doing the right thing here? Is this really what God wants me to do? And he began to research, he began to research arguments for this being good and against this being good, the lifestyle he was living. And one day he was uh, sitting in his chair and he he was thinking about these things and, and as he was leaning back in his chair, he had a vision. And in his vision, God communicated to him directly and said, this is keeping you from me. And the vision ended. And he knew what he had to do. Even though he loved his boyfriend, he said goodbye to him. And he went and lived with his parents and tried to live a heterosexual life. And he was miserable for seven years. He tried to go on dates with women and they were a flop and they failed and he felt embarrassed. And nothing was really working right and yet he was committed to not living in the way that his natural desires were inclined to go. He moved away to another state, got a job there. And he went to church his first Sunday and saw a woman there in that church. And as soon as he saw her, he had this powerful voice in his head saying, that's the one. He ended up marrying that woman. He ended up telling that woman about his past. It was difficult for her, but she married him anyway. They have a marriage now that's been going on for some years that my friend Bob would say is not normal. It's not a normal marriage because Bob says, I'm not a normal person. He he loves his wife. But he also says, as he puts it, it's easier with guys. But that's a part of himself that he says, I have to live in a pure way the way God wants me to live. They have children. They love those children very much. They love each other very much. One day he was working out in a gym and there was a man who came up to him and started hitting on him. Well, my friend Bob turned him down but very gently said, let's talk. As they talked, he found out that this friend of his was a former Catholic priest who left the priesthood because of his sexual orientation. And as they talked, Bob found that this other man had himself run from God and was far from God. And they began to talk every day, every single day. They began to read the Bible with each other every day. And Bob found with this other man a best friend like he never knew he could have in his life, someone who understood him and he understood. Every day, they read the Psalms together. They pray together holding hands. They love each other deeply and profoundly, and that love is non-sexual. I want you to understand that there are options, there are ways forward for fulfillment that are not in the rigid stereotypes that we expect. I mean, think about in the Bible itself, people like David and Jonathan 
and the profound and intimate and affectionate friendship that they had with one another such that David said of Jonathan after Jonathan died, your love for me was greater than that of women. And they were both heterosexuals. Look at Jesus and the Apostle John, who is known in the Gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved and who spent the Last Supper leaning back on Jesus' chest as they were eating with one another. Look at these pictures of these guys from a hundred years ago. These are ordinary pictures of ordinary heterosexual men who had pictures of each other in these really affectionate positions that are like embarrassing and awkward and weird to us now, but were totally normal back then. Why was it totally normal back then? Because ironically, when homosexuality is nearly unknown in a society, men will be affectionate, intimate friends with one another. And when homosexuality is an evident reality, then men keep distant and aloof from one another because they don't want to be accused of being gay. I learned to go against the cultural grain from my youth pastor, Ron Short, a guy who used to say to us, I love you, man. You light up my life. A guy who gave great big hugs. A guy who encouraged us to give each other great big hugs. I grew up thinking that men being best friends with other men, intimate friends, even physically affectionate friends, was normal and okay and had nothing to do with being gay or straight. That's a possibility. That's open in our, cult, in our church. It ought to be. I'm not pretending, though, that that's completely satisfying to a homosexual person. There is still major sacrifice, but you know what? Jesus doesn't promise that there won't be sacrifice to follow him. In fact, he promises that everyone who follows him will sacrifice, and he doesn't promise that everyone will sacrifice the same way or that everyone will sacrifice equally. But he also doesn't promise that everyone who follows him will be equally glorified when he comes back. So, that's speaking to the Christian with same-sex attraction. I want to speak now to the Christian with gender misalignment. And, and a great book on this is a book by this guy, Mark Yarhouse, called Understanding Gender Dysphoria. It's also somewhat technical from a psychological point of view, but it's, it's very, very valuable and taught me a vast amount. So, what do I mean by gender misalignment? What I mean is this. Let's talk about three things. One is our biological sex. Okay, like XY chromosomes versus XX chromosomes. Second is our internal sense of maleness or femaleness. This is what we call gender, what we think of ourselves as male or female. And third is how people around you identify your sex. Now, for the vast majority of people, these three things basically line up. Biological sex, internal gender, and how people treat us basically lines up. But for a small minority of people, those three things do not line up. And the umbrella term for those people is transgender. And in fact, I use the term umbrella because the ways in which some people's sex, gender, and identification in society misalign are so diverse that they are really a wide variety of different things. There are some people who are intersex, meaning that because of, of a variety of different um, biological conditions, the way that their sexual organs look when they were born don't look totally male and don't look totally female. And what happens in those situations generally is that the doctor today, usually in the past, unilateral, unilaterally, today in consultation with the parents, makes a decision, are we going to go with male or female? And basically, whatever the, the choice is, cuts off the parts or alters the parts that would be the opposite. And sometimes then these people grow up and they find that the choice that was made by the doctor or the choice that was made by the parents is different from what they feel like they are. And sometimes they find that, that physically they appear to be a woman, but in fact their chromosomes are XY, and genetically they're actually male. That's an example of intersex. Another thing under this umbrella is called gender dysphoria, and that's referring to an intense, intense feeling that I'm a woman trapped in a man's body or I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. That, that just doesn't go away. It's this, it's this dissonance within the mind that, that isn't a choice, but it's just there and it doesn't go away. A third version is autogynephilia. This is sort of like gender dysphoria, or it is a version of it, but it's a particular version where instead of it being a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body, it's a man trapped in a man's body. In other words, it's a man who knows that he's a male, and he understands that, and he believes himself to be a male, but really, really, really wants to be a woman and finds himself um, feeling fulfilled sexually when he acts like a woman 
and when, he is when, when somebody who um, is attracted to him is attracted to him as a woman. Then there's this term, gender queer, and this refers to somebody who's saying, well, I'm not really either one or I'm both, male and female together in this body. And then there's the term gender fluid, which some people use to mean I go back and forth. Sometimes I feel male, sometimes I feel female. It depends on the day or the month or the season or the year or the time in my life. And then there are people who are drag queens or drag kings. These are people who know that they're male or know that they're female, but dress up as the opposite in order to entertain, and they might not identify as transgender at all. So th th in this whole huge umbrella, that group of people that, I call, th that are called gender dysphoric, the prevalence is probably roughly 1 to 12,000 men or 1 to 25,000 women. But in the whole spectrum of all of these, it probably comes out to, from our best knowledge now, about 1 to 250. So there's a very tiny number who are gender dysphoric and also a tiny number, though I don't have the exact statistics, who are intersex. But on this whole spectrum of, of gender misalignment or gender confusion, it's 1 to 250, which is still a small minority, but it means that you and I know people like this. And you might be one. So as you can see, this is complicated. Now to add to the complication, think about giving godly biblical advice to parents of children who appear to have gender dysphoria. Incidentally, most dysphoric children grow out of it when they get to puberty, with or without encouragement, but a large minority don't, and those who do have a high incidence of homosexuality after, pu after puberty. Now think about the fact that transgender people that we come in contact with with the gospel may already be at some point in a process of sex reassignment, and it may only be partly reversible or largely irreversible. As I was preparing for this for months, this sermon, I was thinking if Caitlyn Jenner called me up and said, I watched your sermons online and I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, now what do I do? What am I going to say? What are you going to say? Because there has to be a way for Caitlyn Jenner, right? I mean, there can't possibly be a situation where God says, oh, well, you know, I could redeem anybody, but once you have that surgery, forget it. That's beyond what I can do. That's beyond what I can handle. There's got to be a way for that person. So what do we do as believers? Again, we got to remember and say yes to the big yes of the image of God as male and female. And because of that big yes, we have... Deuteronomy 22.5, an instruction that God gave to Israel. He said, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. He's talking about cross-dressing. But as we saw from that whole spectrum, there's a variety of different reasons that people cross-dress. They don't all do it for the same reason. But the people of God are not to present themselves as a sex they are not, because we have to say yes to the image of God as male and female. There are some transgender people, a few, and by no means all transgender people, as I'll discuss, but there are some who are trying to overthrow sex and gender as standard. They're trying to overthrow male and female as standard because they see that binary structure as oppressive and denying freedom. And they're saying, you can't deny my freedom to express myself and to be who I am. That is rebellious and abominable, and we must not give in to that. We must not give in to extreme voices in our culture who are saying that male and female themselves are inherently oppressive categories. They are not. They are the furniture, they are the structure and the architecture that a gracious God, a good God, has given to humanity. But also notice that for most of the people on the transgender spectrum, their internal sense of gender, even though it's misaligned with their biological sex, is not beyond their ability to make choices about their behavior. For most of them, if, if you fall on a point on the spectrum where you have a desire, even a strong desire, to emulate the other sex as a temptation, you must resist the same way we have to resist any temptation. That particular form of rebellion doesn't get a pass, whereas other forms of sin and rebellion do not. However, there may be some more room for transgender believers than we might assume. There are limits in the Bible to how much you can express a gender that doesn't line up with your sex, but those limits may not be as tight as we might expect. Consider, for example, the patriarchs Jacob and Esau in Genesis. They're, these are twins. These are brothers. Esau is described as this hairy, macho, 
impulsive, rash hunter. Jacob, on the other hand, is smooth-skinned, little body hair, likes to live at home with his mother and cook, and is described as deceitful and manipulative. These are two very different men who come from the same parents and are exhibiting opposite gender stereotypes. But both of them, the Bible describes as being sinful jerks, both of them become good guys by the end of the story, and Jacob, the one who seems more feminine, is the one who ends up being the father of the entire nation of Israel, the people of God. When we talk about differences between the sexes, we're talking about averages. Like, for example, height. The average man is taller than the average woman. But obviously, there are exceptions. Exhibit A, Jim and Shirley Bickers. Okay? Right? Shirley is tall for a woman. Jim is short for a man. Right? But but that has nothing to do with whether Jim is a man and Shirley is a woman. And likewise, other averages have to do with what a person likes, or how a person talks, or how a person walks, and so forth. And I don't read anything in the Bible that says that that variation is sinful. Besides that, what one culture considers masculine and what another considers feminine does not always line up. And the Bible doesn't insist on one cultural form over another. In some cultures, cultures it's considered manly to be the person who is out there farming. And it's womanly to stay home and to do music and poetry. And in other cultures, it's manly for the man to stay home and do music and poetry and for the woman to go out there and farm so that the man can do that. But, but the Bible doesn't say yes or no to either of those things. And also remember that gender tendency is not the same as sexual orientation. I've known men who are more feminine than average and who are entirely attracted to women and men that are as masculine as can be who are attracted to men. I've known quite a number of choir directors over the course of my life, and a number of those choir directors have actually seemed like rather girly guys. Like, they're interested in kind of girly things, and they talk in somewhat girly ways, but these guys were like totally male, and they were totally into women, you know, and had great relationships with their wives. That's okay. That's not a problem. There's a Christian man that I know well, who as far as gender, sees himself to be equally masculine and feminine according to the standard assumptions in our culture. But he identifies himself as male and presents himself as male 100%. And also, there's an extreme end of the spectrum that is beyond mere temptation. Gender dysphoria and intersex, they go beyond the rest of this stuff. A gender dysphoric or intersexual person does not want to bend gender. Quite the contrary, they strongly affirm the sacred identity, integrity of gender. And that's the whole problem. They desperately want their gender and their sex to line up. And that can be so extreme that it's like a living nightmare. The person sometimes feels like they are losing their mind even to the point of being suicidal. Now, this is my opinion, but tentatively, I am inclined to believe that something different is indicated here. I am inclined to believe that for the truly gender dysphoric or intersex person, there may be room for some expression of the opposite sex, of the the opposite gender, to the least invasive way possible. Not the most invasive invasive way of complete sex reassignment surgery, but the least invasive way possible in a way that they're able to manage themselves and keeps them sane. For example cross-dressing but only at home and not out in public, or out in public having undergarments of the opposite sex, if that helps them to get through the day. Now, this is a really delicate thing. This is a really difficult thing. We don't have all the answers on this, but I think that for that extreme edge of transgender, we're talking about a medical condition that we want to try to treat and that is not based on sinful inclination to gender bend. You're welcome to disagree with me on that point. So what does this mean for our church? We have to stand firm on the image of God as male and female. But homosexual and transgender people, like you and me, like all of us, but even more acutely, want to know who they are. And they want to know what community they belong to. And there is a world out there that says to them, if you're homosexual, 
It's not just a feature of your life. It's what you are and who you are. You are a homosexual, and that is the most important thing about your life. And you can become a part of our community of homosexuals, and we will embrace you just the way you are. We are where you belong. And the same things for transgender as well. And if they have a choice between a worldly community that says you belong with us just the way you are and a Christian community that says you don't measure up and it's your fault, which do you think they're going to choose? What is our answer to this? Well, we've got a second big yes. And that second big yes is that Christ is the image of God. And Christ is our identity. Look at what Paul writes in Colossians. He says, you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. See, what we can offer to the homosexual person, what we can offer to the transgender person is we can say, that might be how you are, but that's not who you are. Because who you are is a person created in the image of God. And who you can be is the very reflection of Christ Jesus, who is perfect human and is perfect God. And that's who you really are deep down. And we are the community where you belong. We are the community where you belong as a person whose image is Christ. Because whether I'm gay or straight, if my image is Christ, whether I'm transgender or cisgender, if my image is Christ, then my ultimate identity is not my sexual orientation or not even my gender understanding, but my primary identity is Christ, is Christ Jesus. And that applies to you too. That applies to you if you're straight, that applies to you. If you're not transgender, is your identity Christ Jesus? Is Christianity something that you do on the weekend? Is Christianity something that you do every other weekend or every third weekend? Or you do it when, you know, there's not camping season or hunting season or football season or youth baseball season or whatever other season of the year it happens to be? Is being a member of Christ who you are and what you are? Because if so, you belong in this community. And if not then I hope you're on your way. I hope you're on your way. A person in the witness protection program gets a new identity. And in the same way, a witness to Jesus Christ as Lord and God and Savior gets a new identity. And that identity and that community is what we have to offer. It's what we have to offer the two men who are homosexuals who have gotten married according to the laws of the state and then come to know Jesus Christ. And they come to the conclusion, we can't be sexually intimate anymore, but we still do love each other. And who come and become members of this church, who sit beside each other, maybe discreetly holding hands while they read the Bible and hear the word of God. That's what we have to offer to the transgender person who experiences that confusion but is saying, I'm going to go with what God has given me in my body, and I'm going to identify that that's who I am, even though there's some ways that I talk and walk that don't seem to quite fit right, and maybe my hairstyle seems a little bit borderline. That's what we have to offer that person. Christ is our identity. Christ is the image of God. Please stand for the benediction.